and we're looking forward to a fantastic day. Thank you very much indeed for being here. It is a 9am start, however we are starting a few minutes early because we have the ubiquitous safety messages, etc, etc, housekeeping that we need to make our way through. And so without further ado, it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce the Director of the Art of the Lady Museum, David Gardner. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to Hoi Cook, home of the Royal Australian Air Force and the Rack Museum. First of all, the noise of a hanging rattling, no, it's not going to fall in. We've been doing that for uh, since the Second World War. It keeps the techos away from the night time when they're working. <laughs> The other thing is, if we have a fire, there's two exits. You go back the way you came, or you can see the exit over here. You'll probably be following my heels, okay? Secondly, the toilets are just up here between the gullies. And third, at lunchtime, lunch will be served I think the food in the other hangar. But I would appreciate it if you could keep the food in the hangars. We don't need it up through the gullies because the curator can fight. And uh, you'll feel it all. So please, uh, if you're going to have lunch, have it, and then if you want to go to the museum, have a look. At this stage of the game, the stock with puff is a bit marginal. The wind is up for the moment, and we won't be risking it. So in fact, we'll have it over in the other hangar with the B2A and the box kite anyway. So if it flies, we'll let you know, and if it doesn't fly, we'll let you know. So enjoy the day. So. Thank you. Well, again, thank you very much indeed for your attendance here uh, today. Uh, if you have any questions or queries uh, about the program, then I'm more than happy to answer whatever I can. On the back of your name tags, you'll find there is a program uh, printed four sheets for the four sessions uh, for today. Uh, there are show bands that each one of you has received. Uh, lots of information from many of our kindred associations. Uh, some of you will find that there may not be a wartime magazine uh, in your show bag. Uh, we didn't quite get enough numbers. Uh, we're far in excess of what we were able to get. So if you all are already a subscriber to wartime, you might like to hand it perhaps over to someone else who hasn't had the joy of reading the magazine so far. Um, all spelling mistakes on name tags uh, are completely mine. Uh, thanks to Keith Fretwell, Bob Fretwell, Barry Fretwell, or uh, I think I finally got it right. Uh, but uh, anyway, it's great to see him here. Uh, again, we are looking forward to a fantastic day. Thank you very much for your uh, attendance. Uh, at the end of each uh, speaker's uh, address, there will be time for some questions and answers. We have deliberately marked the speaker's name tags in blue, with guest speaker in red, so that you can ensure they have a wonderful time at morning tea and lunch time conversing with 83 of their brand new friends. <laughs> Without further ado, it's my great pleasure to call upon the patron of the Military History and Heritage Victoria to welcome us and to introduce the guest speaker. And I now call upon Major General Jim Barry. very much, Doctor. It's my uh, pleasure as patron of uh, Military History and Heritage Victoria to welcome you to this conference. The Military History and Heritage Association was established only a little time ago in late 2010 and was formally launched as an incorporated association in May of 2011 by none other than Professor Jeffrey Blaney, and I do recall his speech to us where he challenged our association to be relevant. Hopefully we are relevant. Our establishment aim was to provide an inclusive forum for groups and individuals who were interested, and even passionate, may I say, about military history and or heritage, and certainly, especially here in Victoria. One of the elements of that aim conduct a conference such as this one, this time on Air Force history. As patron, I've been pleased to provide oversight with my colleagues Professor Bruce Skates and Dr Jim Wood of our Executive Committee, as this has come to fruition. One of the beauties of being a patron is you don't have to do too much other than open conferences, but it's 
great watching the executive committee at work. I'm personally delighted with the program, the quality of the speakers uh, that will be presented to you today. I trust you enjoy the conference, so on behalf of the executive committee, I welcome you and look forward to catch up with you during the course of the day. Before I proceed to introduce our speaker, could you please turn off all those electric devices other than your placement? <laughs> so again, welcome. It's now my pleasure to introduce Wing Commander Nick Leray Mayer, AM and allegedly retired, to deliver the opening address. Nick is a classic example of an airman adventurer who's done just about everything in his life. He joined the Air Force in 1956 as an engineer apprentice. He got found out and was commissioned in 1962. After his pilot training, he flew Sabre and Media fighters until 1970 when he converted to helicopters and served with 9 Squadron in Vietnam. It is of note that he became 9 Squadron CO in 1979. He resigned from the service in 1983 to take on the Aviation Director of the Multinational Force and Observers Organisation, which you believe it at their headquarters in Rome. It must have been terrible. And he obviously had served with them previously to that. In 1987, on return to Australia, he studied at the Australian National University for a couple of years. He then did a 10-year stint with the Civil Aviation Authority, when he apparently got the stitch, and he went back to active flying in the period 2000 to 2003 on a range of aircraft. Super Puma helicopters, Cessna 560, Executive Jet, each worth 300, etc. Hopefully, with all those aircraft types over his flying career, he might tell us about his favourite. He finished his employed life as Group Manager, Aircraft Operations at the Australian International Air Show at Avalon. And that was in the period 2005 to 2011. And during this period of his life, he served as president of the RAF Vietnam Veterans Victorian Association and was the immediate past president of RAF Association Victoria. And he still serves for that organisation as its vice president. Nick Leray Mayer has led a remarkable service life, an interesting and fascinating post-service life and still contributes to his community. I can think of no one more suitable to deliver the opening address. Would you please welcome Wing Commander Nick the Ray Mayor. Worries me when I see that uh, collect and preserve sign down there because uh, David Calabrish is Sebastian Wood. Murgatroyd Gardner, the director, keeps telling me that uh, since most of the aircraft I flew, including that one there, uh, are in this precinct, he also has a box with my name on it. So, uh, David, if I do go in the box, please try and preserve me. <laughs> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As I came through the gate today, despite the fact that my retired officer's pass is no longer valid, uh, the memory of the wonderful days I spent here at Point Cook, the home of the Air Force, came flooding back, as they always do. And I must admit, I do get a bit of nostalgia when I come to see them. I was privileged to undertake my pilot training here at Point Cook in the early 60s. And the sheer joy of learning to fly, even if my initial flying instructor, Bob Holland, made comments like, right three, Takeoff technique improving, actually stayed within the, within the land, uh, lane boundaries today, will always be with me. And today I get to talk and interact with you 
about those men in the Australian following group who took their first flights here so many decades ago and how their experiences have contributed to our world of military aviation. But first let me thank General Barry for that introduction and the organisers of the Military History and Heritage Victoria for inviting me to address you today. I must have been to some trepidation when I saw the list of speakers who will follow me. Mindful of them, I'm a nominated to uh, What should I, or what would I talk about? Should I focus on just one key element? Or perhaps just a quick run over the time? By the seat of their pants. So, excuse oh, me, sir. Sorry. The hanger is very noisy. Can you speak up a little bit? Yep, sure. Uh, and I'll, I'll try and use the microphone as well. Yep. <laughs> By the seat of their pants. What a title. For me, that immediately conjures up that mental picture a relative, a relatively fragile, ragtop aircraft. Crewed by pilots dressed in riding gear with an apparent laid back approach boarded on the horizontal. And if you see some photos of some riding boots, John boots, they, uh, they love them. And when you look around some of the aircraft today, boy, <coughs> here and in the other hangar, ragtop probably doesn't describe them properly, but you have to be a gutsman just to get in. However, while there are times that uh, there may have been an element of truth in that, that snapshot, in reality, the lot of our first airmen was quite different. And today, our task is to see what we can uh, see if we can address a number of the aspects of their wartime service, such as where did the Australians fit into the Allied air operations? How did they write as pilots? How did they adapt to their new aircraft types and tactics? And how did they fare against a skillful and well made While these are the questions, I'm inclined to use my time to discuss the extent to which that experience nurtured or shaped the training I gained during my time flying fighter aircraft with the RAF. Essentially, what did later fighter pilots learn from the experience of those who were really the genesis of Australia's air power? For me, I believe one of the primary lessons that was, uh, was that no matter how superior the fighter aircraft itself, it was how the aircraft was flown. In other words, the skill and the focus of the pilot that made all the difference. A successful pilot had to have not only the basic aircraft handling training, but had to have, or at least strive to achieve, the mindset that he would not be bested in any fight or action, no matter. During my fighter training, my instructors and colleagues strive to instill into me, as well as other pilots on conversion, that desire to give in all my all and not accept defeat. Thus life within the fighter squadron became incredibly competitive, with no quarter given even to your mates, and to walk back into the crew room holding up a gun camera with his photo on it. You can live on that for at least an hour before he turned the tables on you. But if you, uh, you know, eat your heart out, uh, Nettie, you're on can and camera. That was, at times, the be all and end all. <coughs> and the same, we used to have ladders with, for the, not top gun, but who could fire the most accurate rockets, the bombs and the guns, etc. And the stride was always there to be top of the hoop, it's not the strongest one at the bottom, holding them all up. This, 
and I'm not going into my second best mindset, which I'm sure was perceived by outsiders as somewhat egotistical, is clearly evident when you read fighter stories emanating from all the major air battles, be it World War I, World War II, Korea, Yom Kippur, and even over North Vietnam. Interestingly enough, very few have come out of Iraq and Afghanistan because there's seldom been an air battle there where aircraft have actually manoeuvred against each other. Those that did manage to get airborne were quickly taken out by long-range missiles, which have kind of taken the fun out of being a fighter pilot. Another course was the importance of position or situational awareness. Beware the hunt and the summer. From the early days of World War I, when Singleton aircraft flew around primarily on reconnaissance, it quickly became apparent that they could be easily picked off, especially in single-seaters, <clears throat> since the pilot was often focusing on the task that he'd been given. And without, with all due respect to my army colleagues, being single-minded, you know, if he was told to look at the ground, he looked at the bloody ground. They, uh, and not seeing, uh, not enough of seeing who else was flying nearby. Situational awareness. Pilots had to learn the value of one of the established principles of war. Surprise. And yet they had to formulate countermeasures. The first counter tactic was the adoption of the wingman. Now two aircraft would fly together, and by the way, that's the way fighter pilots learn to talk. If you want to shut a fighter pilot up, tell him to put his hands in his pocket, and he becomes a good, because there he was with his mate. But it was the wingman's task to keep an eye behind, above, and below, so his leader could get on the job, or get on with the job of taking out the enemy aircraft. If engaged in attacking enemy aircraft, that was what Wingman's job was to do. But it was also to protect the leader so he could get back home and drink to his success. As we saw in later conflicts, the Wingman was often considered to be expendable in the larger picture. And for those that have read Paul Brickell's uh, book, Reach for the Sky, Douglas Varda, <coughs> himself an interesting pilot, really did regard wingmen as a disposable item so long as they kept uh, him safe. Interestingly though, keeping a good lookout, especially above and behind, meant that during the early years of World War II, the wingman was almost constantly manoeuvring his aircraft. Why? Well, this is not a, uh, a go at the engineers, but whereas World War I fighter aircraft the pilot was generally sitting there in the open and he could look around. Think back to the early fighter aircraft. Very few of them had what we would now call a bubble cockpit. The beautiful Spitfire. Everything perfect in shape. And there was only one catch for the fighter pilot. From about the five o'clock position or half past four position round to the half past seven position you were absolutely blind. As a compromise, they put a rear view mirror up. But <clears throat> looking in a rear view mirror up to spot an oncoming aircraft was fairly difficult. So you quite often had the weakman doing this, looking down in deep into his six to see. And by doing that, quite often go to a fair position because the sun would be reflecting off the aircraft as he maneuvered. This in turn required the position. And one of the other things too, as the wingman, if you're doing that and you're up real close, uh, there was a fair chance you'd take the leader out anyway. So they backed off a little bit. But 
This in turn required the wingman to position further away from the lead to avoid a mid-air collision. A requirement that seemingly took quite a while to be understood and needlessly cost lives. When I started flying sailors, I, uh, and it flowed on from the Second World War, for those that have looked at that Second World War and the First World War, <coughs> aircraft started as they started to fly in formation, the left hand and right hand figure four, the lead in the middle, for the right hand, wing in the air, number three and number four, so they could split in the two. came all the way through till about the uh, end of the Sabre days. But in a Sabre, uh, and there's a friend of mine there that can probably remember it, and we sat fairly close. 650 feet was the ideal position. If you got closer than 550, you got, got growled at by the leader, and if you got more than about 750, you would declare uh, a bit of a sort. But when you're doing 350 knots and you've got a leader that's maneuvering his aircraft around a lot, it took a fair amount of uh, concentration to be looking deep in your six and still worried about running into the, to the, uh, the lead. Later on in the final world, we dropped it back to about 1,500 feet and we actually became far more effective in that stage. And we also... Uh, and I'll go on to this tactic now, because the introduction of the Whitman saw an introduction of a new defensive tactic. The defensive or vertical split. A lot of those early fights, aircraft would just turn. Some of the smarter ones realised that you know, if he's turning there and I want to get over to him, if I went that way, I can't pull and then some of the even smarter ones worked out that if we're flying as a pair and someone attacks us as a pair, if we split, he's going to have to make up his mind which one he wants. And quite often, the attacker, knowing that the wingman was the most, tended to be the, the less experienced, would chase that one. So they would split like that. The attacker would go after the weakman who was now starting to turn as fast as he possibly could. And as you got lateral and vertical distance, the lead just rolled over the back and down and you were behind. And you now had the classical sandwich. The weakman who might get shot down but he was expendable, but you're sitting there and you're getting ready with a sticker to put another one on the side of the air. as we went through from vampires to meteors. Talking about vampires, when there was a vampire out there, could you imagine trying to fight that as the train? No. Probably on the mark too. At least it had a bubble uh, cockpit. But you can see behind it. So, yeah. The uh, two up. Now the basic tactic is still taught today and obviously involves greater airspace to accomplish. Now just before I close, my study of World War Aviation shot down a few conceptions I've gained over time. One for the use of the big wings. Paul Bridgefield's reach for the sky, which I must admit was one of the genesis for me to ever to want to be a pilot. I've always assumed that the use of the big wings was a World War II concept. I mean, I was conscious of the big flying circuits, etc., <coughs> of World War I. But I always thought it was really a World War II concept, and the result of a long argument between the Air Officers Commanding 10 and 11 group, with, with Douglas Barber, I mean, spurring on Lee Mallory. However, while aware of the Baron circuits, I was not aware that the argument for and against the use of big wings also embroiled Australia's two major aviation theatres of action. And for those that want to go on the web and have a look at it, those fighting the war in the desert versus those in the Western Front 
both had valid points for and against the big wing. And it was quite a lacrimonious discussion between the pilots as to the value of both. But whatever they started off, most of those fights ultimately degenerated down into one v one. The big wing concepts essentially died after World War II because it was simply too hard to coordinate. Thank you for your attention and I trust you have an informative and enjoyable day. And if I can add a final remark, it only has to get better. <laughs>
being spruced up with some money being put in restoring the uh, health barrack buildings uh, opposite the museum here. Uh, I remember when I first came to Point Cook in the late 1980s, uh, when I made my first association with the museum and Dave Gardner, the, uh, the place was looking dated then. It uh, subsequently became looking uh, very dilapidated and dated. Uh, but it's good to see uh, something of a rejuvenation. But a number of speakers have reminded us this morning the birthplace of the RAAF. And of course, it's also the birthplace of the Australian Flying Corps. It's appropriate for us to be having a conference on the history of the Australian Flying Corps on the day after Remembrance Day. This year was the 94th anniversary of the, end of, uh, the armistice ending World War I. And of course that's really the date which puts the effective end to the, uh, the history of the Australian Flying Corps. Although it took a few months to return the personnel home, um, the uh, coming of the armistice was really the end of the uh, AFC experience. With the centenary of Anzac in 18 months' time, beginning with the commemoration of 100 years of military aviation here at Point Cook in March 2014, uh, we'll see another reason to be having a conference here. Uh, after all, a, a number of the famous uh, AFC identities began their war service at Gallipoli with other elements of the uh, Australian Imperial Force, thinking here of men like George Jones and uh, Sir Ross Smith. So, military history and heritage Victoria is to be congratulated for having the vision, I believe, for organising an event like this, and especially for its choice of venue. Now, today's program has been devised to cover a lot of ground regarding the AFC's history, aspects such as recruitment, training, aircraft, and personal stories. I think all these aspects are, are all important for raising understanding of the AFC and its history, and particularly its history in Australia. Sadly, I think it's true to say that the AFC received little recognition these days, especially in comparison with the image of the digger, uh, the light horseman, and, and other iconic figures of World War I. But I think the time has come to, to rectify this gap in our national history. I think it's important, though, in doing this, that we ensure we highlight and value what's enduring, what's significant about the AFC experience. I think we need to give attention to the context of the AFC's part in World War I and focus on the AFC's lasting legacy. Now my presence here today as our both historian and the title of my talk today, I think give a clear clue to what I think on this subject. But I'll come to that in due course. But first I want to focus on the national and international dimensions of the AFC's contribution because I believe this provides the missing context the background to the raising of the AFC supplies the vital shape and meaning to what came after. It's often thought that the AFC was brought into being in direct response to the start of World War I. We actually find the first use of the AFC name before the war start. Military Order 382 of the 14th of July 1914, makes clear that everything is in train for the formation of the AFC at least three weeks before the start of World War I. The previous military order, the one I've highlighted in red, explained the relationship of the Corps with the Central Flying School that had already been brought into existence and was about to start its training mission. Military Order 383, the one immediately after the one I've highlighted, gave authority for raising number one flight of the Australian Flying Corps in financial year 1914-1915. This, I believe, provides the vital evidence that shows Australia was taking positive steps to enter the military aviation field well before World War I broke onto the scene. I think it explains the full significance of the actions that have been taken to start flying training in Australia. The ads that were placed looking for uh, aviation instructors in December 1911. 
the, the actions taken to select a suitable site for the school during uh, the early part of 1912, which initially saw what the site identified in Canberra. The orders that were placed mid-year and late in uh, 1912, the aircraft that would provide the initial training. After the, third, the lead instructor had arrived in Australia in January 1913, he changed the site here to Point Cook. And that started the process of acquiring the land to actually set up the school. That was done during 1913, so that by November, December, people actually moved onto this site and began erecting the school itself, leading up to the first flight of the Central Flying School on the 1st of March, 1914. All this activity wasn't an end in itself. The point was they were about to train the first pilots for the Australian Flying Corps. Now, of course, the AFC that was envisaged wasn't the body that eventuated. The advent of World War I most definitely altered and adjusted the scope and scale of the plan. The AFC that was first thought of was not a combat force. It was wanted purely for reconnaissance. In June 1913, the military board had been considering plans for point officers of the Australian Intelligence Corps, quote, for duty with the Flying Corps, unquote. That was because the Intelligence Corps had been cast with oversight for carrying out military survey of Australia. Topographical mapping was seen as the principal mission of the utility of the Australian Flying Corps were originally thinking of creating. Now, although World War I diverted the Defence Department from its original plan, the preparation that had been taken in uh, implementing uh, that, that plan put us in the box seat to get an aviation arm operating almost immediately. We had the man, means on hand to consider providing air support to a special force being sent to New Guinea uh, at the end of 1914, for example. Although we can say Australia was well placed to enter early military aviation, the early military aviation field, we weren't uniquely placed. Other British dominions were also taking steps at the same time. Even New Zealand had been quick off the mark. They had a Blerio monoplane, which was a gift of the Imperial Air Fleet Committee, uh, as early as September 1913. And they had a lone military pilot who had been trained in England. Came the war, they sent the aircraft to the United Kingdom in a troop ship, uh, for use by the Royal Flying Corps. A pilot, Lieutenant W. W. Byrne, who was Australian by birth actually, was sent to Mesopotamia in 1915. He was killed alongside Australia's first air casualty of the war. Canada also responded to the call of empire by immediately offering its Canadian Aviation Corps. So it sent three personnel and its only Burgess Dunn biplane off to England on the 30th of September 1914. But neither the Royal Flying Corps nor the Royal Naval Air Service wanted the aircraft. Never flown, it was left to rot in the open on the Salisbury Plain. Instead, volunteer personnel became Canada's contribution to the air war. The RFC opened its own schools in Canada and produced over 3,000 pilots and observers. Before the war was out, nearly 23,000 Canadians had joined the British Air Services. They won 800 decorations, including three BCs, most famously that of Major Billy Bishop. But Canada never formed any air units of its own until World War I was nearly over. Only in the last months of 1918 did it form a Canadian Air Force of two squadrons in England, and also a Royal Canadian Naval Air Service for the Coast of Defence of Canada. Both those corps were disbanded soon afterwards, in mid-1919 and December 1918, respectively. So Canadian individuals, Canadian airmen, served as individuals, and they returned to Canada as individuals. South Africa, too, had begun forming a flying section in May 1913. But its six pilots all went to the Royal Flying Corps for advanced training in April 1914. But by October, uh, October uh, five of them were on active service in France. 
South Africa had called its airmen and formed the South African Aviation Corps, which became operational in May 1915. This went to German South West Africa soon after, and when that campaign successfully ended in July, the South African Air Corps was uh, disbanded. So subsequently, Canada, oh, sorry, South Africa contributed only personnel to the British Air Services, some 3,000 of them. Even within Australia's region of the world, our contribution was not alone. If you're thinking regional countries that have an air force, or you're thinking about air force, you might think of Japan, but you'd be wrong. It was actually the Kingdom of Siam. It also established an aviation section in 1913, after its first pilots that it sent to train in France returned home to begin flying eight aircraft being purchased from France. And in March 1914, the unit was upgraded to become kind of Siam's Army Air Corps. By July 1917, Siam actually sent an expeditionary force to fight alongside the Allies on the Western Front. 1,250 strong, 850 from the Transport Corps, 400 from the Army Air Corps. So this picture is of some of the members of the Air Corps on operational training in France. So the standout feature in my mind of World War One was not that Australia had contributed an appropriate share of effort towards supporting the Air Corps, uh, but it was almost it was the almost unique form that that contribution took. Australia was the only Dominion that sent formed units as part of a distinctive national air force. Uh, it's well known that uh, the, Brit the British were originally voted to give recognition of the Australian squadrons. They designated them as RFC units within the British numbering system. It was only from January 1918 that the Australian numbering of AFC squadrons accepted. The point is that Australia was able to identify and appreciate the contribution that its airmen made to the war. That was not just at the time, but in later, year, later years when Australia with other dominions had formed peacetime air forces. So this was also the main legacy that Australia gained from its wartime experience. The pre-war arrangements for introduction of aviation to the Commonwealth Military Forces meant that it was almost certain that this plan would be carried through on the return to peace. That was never really in question. It's why in 1918 Australia placed orders for fresh training aircraft for its central flying school here at Point Cook replacing the mishmash of tired and outdated types that were required over the course of the year, of course of the war year, talking here the soft of the puffins and the first of the Avro 504 trainers. It also ignited a debate in 1918 over the form of the air forces that the Army and the Navy would want to have after the war. The decision had been taken by governments early in January 1919 Australia would follow the example set by Britain in 1918 and establish a single and separate air force meeting the needs of both Army and Navy, purely on the grounds of cost alone. Now the offer that Britain made soon afterwards of providing a gift of more surplus aircraft and equipment cemented this decision in place. It created a need though for an interim air service, which is duly called the Australian Air Corps, to take possession of the Imperial Griffith aircraft that began arriving in Melbourne from January 1920. And that followed the, disband, the arrival of the return to Australia and disbandment of the Australian Flying Corps around the middle of 1919. So the scene was now set for the formation of the Australian Air Force on the 31st of March 1921, or the RLF as it became in August of that year. What were the influences of the AOC on the successor force? Is it possible to identify the impact of the legacy of the AOC and the later part of the AOC? The point should be made, I guess, at the start, that really there was no other contender in Australia for the title of direct descendant of the AOC. The Australian Air Corps had always only been intended as an interim force. It was only meant to receive, unpack, and store the Imperial gift. It did very little flying. From the outset of its existence, the RAAF was very conscious that it was both the successor of the AFC uh, for both its example 
and the basis of the conditions that it created. A good example can be seen in the squadron traditions adopted. Although the RWA had no number of squadrons until seven years, uh, several years after its formation, when they did come around, the first of the squadrons that formed were numbers one and three. So I didn't apply for a formal grant of squadron crests until some years later, but when these were received, they drew direct inspiration from the eight of flying four forebears. For example, number one squadron featured the Cross of Jerusalem as the heroic arms of the Holy City, and the diving crocodile was said to uh, refer to the feat of McNamara at BC uh, in uh, 1917. The Free Squad, meanwhile, featured the Fleur de Lis as a reference to its service in France in, uh, in the war. The public, published histories of that period also reflect the same recognition of the AFC example in units whose squadron number had an AFC precedent. These are the, some of the volumes that have been published in recent years. Number two squadron, what do we see on the cover? Uh, the DH-5s, who were first operated by the unit on the Western Front. Three squadron on the top right there. Note the title refers to the birthday of the squadron as 1916. Six squadron, first of the uh, training units of the training wing. Again, have a look at the uh, most distant aircraft and uh, the 1917 birthday referred to it. Now, the number seven squadron history that we've just recently published uh, also begins its narrative of what was essentially a World War II squadron by referring to the uh, World War I antecedents. The first, <coughs> the first aircraft that equipped the other lab also carried some AFC overtones. The Avro 504 trainers that arrived in the Imperial Group were the same as were used by the squadrons of AFC training wing based in England throughout 1918. And the SE 5A uh, fighter, uh, which was a type well known to at least two squadrons during the first months of uh, 1918, I put this view graph up because I wasn't quite sure how we'd be uh, oriented in this gallery, but of course right behind me is the real thing. <laughs> the light bombers received with the Imperial Grip, the DH-9 and the DH-9A, were familiar from the war for many Australian you know, men, but they weren't used by the AFC squadrons. The chief legacy that the AFC passed to the other left was in its first element. I think that was almost inevitably so, given that preference was given to the recruitment of the RLF from officers and men who had served in the air services during World War I. <coughs> the personnel that were enlisted in the RLF weren't exclusively from the Australian Flying Corps, but many, most of them were, and they provided a rich, rich injection to the new force. I'm thinking here of uh, figures such as uh, William, Har uh, William Anderson, who was from number three squadron, who went on the RWF seniority list as number three and rose to become an Air Vice Marshal. Harry Covey, the highest AFC ace, 29 victories while serving with four squadron. He actually left the uh, RWF as a wing commander in the 1930s and went across to the civil aviation branch. During World War II, he re-enlisted in the RWF, rose to the, uh, to be Commodore and Commander of the First Tactical Air Force. Adrian Cole, an airman originally with one squadron, uh, who had went on to achieve 10 air victories with number two squadron, Air Vice Marshal during World War II. McNamara, as we've heard already, the uh, only Air VC of the Australian Flying Corps, uh, serving with one squadron in the Middle East. Interesting because he's the only member uh, of the VC who survived his feet to uh, wear the tunic of the RAAF, Air Vice Marshal during World War II. 
Henry Wrigley, a member of three squadron, went on to um, be an air vice marshal in World War II, heading our overseas headquarters in, uh, in Europe, and uh, later emerged as probably the, the first thinker on air power issues that thrown up within the RAAF. And I put him there to complete the panel. Lawrence Wacker, uh, who served with one and three squadron uh, during the war, uh, joined the RAAF. And after leaving the RAAF in 1930 as a wing commander, went on to become one of the principal uh, aircraft designers uh, in Australia. We mustn't overlook, of course, the two leading figures of the RAAF's first 30 years. Richard Williams and George Jones. Williams was, of course, the, uh, the first, um, or one of the uh, commanders of the number one squadron uh, as a major initially in the Middle East, promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and became the uh, commander of the 40 Army Wing PRAF. He was, in fact, the only member of the AFC to achieve Lieutenant Colonel rank. The first of those being uh, Oswald Watt, who took command of the training wing uh, for the AFC in, uh, in England. But George Jones, having done quite well for himself as a captain with four squadron uh, in the AFC, in Distinguished Flying Cross, went on in the RLF to make his name as director of training. Uh, and probably that led on to the fact that uh, both these men became Chiefs of Air Force, Chief of Air Star, so we're known back then. Uh, Richard Williams from 1922 to 1939. A long reign, theoretically, of 17 years, but it was on and off, shared with another uh, senior officer of the RAAF, who wasn't an AFC member, uh, but batched then by Jones, who had a 10 year stint, booting through the height of the Second World War. Um, and it was the longest continuous term of the Chief of Air Staff. Interestingly, in between these two men was uh, Air Chief Marshal uh, Sir Charles Burnett, who had commanded the Corps Wing uh, in the Middle East uh, at the same time as Richard Williams was commanding the 48th Army Wing. It's not just the officers of the Australian Flying Corps that rose to provide the senior leaders of the RAAF. You also have some notable airmen, like George McAdoll. As you can see, a sergeant here from the Second Flying School, uh, rose, I think, in the warrant office by the end of the war, ended up as an air vice marshal in the years straight after World War One. Oh, sorry, World War Two. And uh, Arthur Spud Murphy, uh, flying with one squadron, flying T. Lawrence around the, the desert uh, in Transjordan and uh, a later rose to Air Commodore and uh, Head of uh, Equipment Services in the RAAF. We should also recognise some others who did not join the RAAF in the 20 years of peace separated World War I and World War II, but they, uh, these men did enter the RAAF service during World War II. For example, Roy King, who had been the AFC's second highest ace, uh, he ended up as a group captain commanding here at Point Cook in 1941. He died here. And uh, Sir Thomas White, who uh, contributed the, the famous dip to the hangars here at Point Cook uh, and survived the experience of being a uh, POW of the Turks, uh, ended up uh, as a group captain uh, during World War II, having taken lead of his parliamentary duties. Well, Point Cook. Point Cook's role as the uh, assembly or departure point for the Australian Flying Corps squadrons made this base a special focal point uh, in our military also. Uh, this is something I've extracted off the uh, publication called On This Day in Rack History. Um, and while we're here at Point Cook, we may care to take a look at the Air Force Memorial across there. Uh, it was seen singularly appropriate to put a memorial to Australian Airmen of World War I here on the RAAF's uh, principal base at Point Cook. Even in the RAAF Association, we 
find another uh, ongoing connection with the Australian Flying Corps, which typically links and keeps alive the historical relationship. I've extracted these few words of explanation about the RAP Association off the RAP Association's website. And it's just interesting to note that they refer to themselves even today as the Australian Flying Corps and RAP Association Inc. That is its formal title. Other both association is just the short end. And it is specifically mentioned the Australian Flying Corps Association within the respective divisions of the foundation bodies of the association. So my point is simply the other body is very much aware and conscious of its origins with the Australian Flying Corps and it values them to this day. It'd be true to say that although the AFC, strictly speaking, is not part of RAA history, the AFC is very much a part of the RAA's heritage. The RAA lived and operated very much in the shadow of the AFC for at least its first decade. It looked like the AFC in its aircraft and its equipment and in its organisation. The 1920s was also the decade when the AFC volume of the official history and the first personal historical accounts began to appear in print. But it's also true that the small size of the AFC told against it when it came to claiming public recognition. By most calculations, the number of officers and airmen that had passed through the ranks of the Australian Flying Corps wouldn't have uh, exceeded much beyond 2,500. But at the same time, the other way had a, a perfect tool for aircraft, or with its aircraft, for recalling the AFC to the public memory. And it's significant that this Adelaide held its first air show or pageant here in Melbourne in 1924. The RAF began to change and modernise in the 1930s when it replaced its single engine, open cockpit, wooden canvas biplanes, all with fixed undercarriages, with fast metal monoplanes, closed cabins, bottom multi engine, and with retractable undercarriages. The picture, of course, changed totally <coughs> on the aircraft front during World War II. And the AFC was left far behind at that point. The legacy lived on in its personnel, most notably Jones, I suppose, and the longevity of AFC members. Jones, Williams, Wrigley, who I mentioned, they all stayed around on the Australian national scene into the 1980s virtually up to 1990. So as I say, ladies and gentlemen, the RAAF fully understands and is aware of the AFC legacy and it values it highly. I think I've probably got a few minutes to take a few questions if you want. Questions from the floor, given our little competition at the moment. But if you have any questions of Dr. Clark, you raise your hands and uh, after we didn't have a Tony Hastings, we'll bring a microphone to you. Thanks, Tony. Thanks, Chris. Neil Smith. In my work out the years, it's always surprised me that there seem to be so many Australian nationals who actually serve with the RFC. Has, has Bruce, can you comment on that when you agree with me? Uh, yes, I, I, it's certainly so. I, I'm not aware that anybody has done a definitive study or analysis of what the numbers would be. But you're, you're certainly correct. A lot of Australians uh, either were in England at the time and uh, enlisted directly into the, AFC, into the RFC. The RFC also put out uh, a call for volunteers to the Royal Flying Corps, which the Australian government sanctioned. So a lot of people um, put their hand up, uh, interestingly enough, white horsemen especially wanted, and uh, they went across directly to the Royal Flying Corps. So you find a lot of Australians who have either a background in the Royal Flying Corps, or even some who, uh, like uh, Jimmy Goble, a Melbourne man, uh, took himself off to England and uh, enlisted in the Royal Navy Air Service. So there is a spread of Australians across the British services, quite distinctly. Uh, others, like the uh, Macquarie brothers, for example, a South Australian uh, uh, pair, 
who took themselves to, uh, uh, they actually went to Australian units, AIA units, answered that call for the Royal Flying Corps, transferred uh, after the war to the RAF, and went on to have highly distinguished careers within the RAF subsequently, having lost the Australian connection at the time. I don't know what the numbers would be, uh, but it's certainly a significant dimension to the AMC story. Um, and there are some of those individuals that uh, returned after the war and featured in the other uh, life story. I'm thinking here of men like uh, Air Commodore Ray Brunel, who actually uh, had been an artillery man in the Middle East, joined the RFC and served in a squadron unit, for example, in the 40 squadron, came out of Air Commodore and the other way. There's others. Thank you, David Grierson, and I think just very briefly, having said that, we shouldn't forget Alec Little, the top scorer, as well. I'm sorry? We shouldn't forget Alec Little, Australia's top scorer, as well. Thank you, Ray. Or Dallas, for example, the second scorer. Yes, thanks Chris, uh, Steve and Ryan. And uh, my question is, with the Air Force being basically a technology-based organisation and attracting young people who are very interested in uh, the, uh, the technology and modernism, how can we make the heritage of the Australian Flying Corps relevant to them? I think a very good start uh, is, is done here Point Cook, for example, we've had in flying models of Huff, for example, that uh, uh, give a, a, a living expression of uh, World War One technology. And the aircraft on this flight here in the gallery, because I think it highlights the uh, extent or the distance that we've travelled in a relatively short period of time. I mean, we consider that uh, we went from World War One to jet age. 20 years effectively uh, and on the space age, nothing demonstrates it, I think, uh, as well as institutions like this. Chris, Mike Rosell, you might remember helping me with getting the last stages of the first little while we out at the risk of plugging myself or coming in. And what is your take on the old complaint that? All these Australians who died for their company but in a foreign uniform are still not on you know, our official laws of honour. Little, for instance, is in the, the Shrines in the summary book, and of course in Canberra on the commemorative role. Well, was that a debate worth the sharing after? No, no. I, I think it, it is a very difficult debate to resolve because, you yeah. know, there have been many circumstances in which Australia has contributed service or personnel to other countries' services. Uh, even when you think back to Iraq, for example, the Air Force has the example of a former member and flight lieutenant not quite old who uh, left the RLF, gone to uh, serve the RAF and was killed on a, 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 a RAF, uh, an RAF Hercules in action. So uh, where do you find someone like that? Uh, it is always the problem. How do you want them appropriately? I think it is certainly a function of the Australian War Memorial because that was created as a, a central uh, centre for commemoration of all Australians uh, ever. But I think by the same token it's appropriate that it's the members of Australia's uniform services that uh, get prior recognition. But I don't think that in any way takes away from the contribution of men and women who served in other countries' service. Thank you. Let's have time for one final question. Okay. One final question at the front. You mentioned the formation of one and two squadron. I uh, wanted three squadrons, but after two squadrons, why did they go? Uh, well, it's interesting, of course, we, uh, we actually had uh, 
a part of one squad in Australia who did one operation in the Middle East. We had two, three, and four all under training almost simultaneously in the same time. Um, in fact, the three squadron went first to the Western Front, followed by two squadron uh, a couple of months later, and four squadron following, following that. But really, you only have the able to on the Western Front uh, effectively for uh, about a year before the end of uh, the Armistice. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, we have anticipated uh, some of these questions, and so we've organised for Mike Rozelle to be here, and he has published his book uh, about a little. Uh, our speaker immediately after the morning tea, Michael Mulcahy, is doing uh, an in-depth study of Australians who served uh, in the RFC and the RAS, so I'm sure he'll be able to answer a number of our questions. Uh, what a wonderful start our keynote speaker uh, has given us this morning. No better person, no uh, person with such depth of scholarship could have delivered such a fantastic keynote speech. It's always wonderful to come along and to hear uh, the depth of research for us all to take away all sorts of incredible information about the formation of the AFC uh, and to hear it right from the horse's mouth, as it were. We've been wonderfully privileged uh, to have Dr. Clark here today, and I think we need to show our appreciation. <laughs> and there is no truth in the rumour that uh, as we speak, that David Gardner is contacting the RIA Budget Department to have all of the signage changed to AFC and RIA. Museum. Is that true, David? Oh, it's morning tea. Uh, all right. <laughs> Treated with the contempt it deserved. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is morning tea now. Uh, we will reconvene at 10.30. Morning tea is just in the next hangar behind you. Thank you very much. <laughs>